First, I would like to thank the organizers for this great opportunity for me to talk here. As titled, my presentation will be on probing interfacial stability in all solid state batteries using STEM scanning transmission electron microscopy. What inspired my interest at the very beginning in all solid state batteries is this Toyota's roadmap published in 2014. This roadmap is still mostly valid. It tells us that while lithium ion batteries that are based on flammable liquid electrolytes is hitting their theoretical limitation in energy density, all solid state batteries offer a much higher energy density and is an essential future battery configuration. In addition to higher energy density, there are many more benefits of solid state batteries. For example, it's safer, charge faster, more compact, last long and last longer. It's great prospective as the future energy storage technology can also be seen by the overwhelming headlines uh, you probably have seen recently. However, why did it take or will it take decades to have a commercial product? This is because we have had and still have technical challenges in our solid state batteries. And in my opinion, issues related to interfaces has been the main challenge, and some of them still remain. In a solid state battery with polycrystalline solid electrolytes, the interfaces include those between electrodes and electrodes, as well as the grain boundaries within solid electrolytes. Interfacial challenges often result in in unknown larger interfacial resistivity, unexpected dendrite growth, or limited cyclability. Since the interfaces are embedded in the cell and spatially confined, they are very difficult for most characterization techniques to probe. But looking at local features is the strength of STEM, scanning transmission electron microscopy. For those of you who are not familiar to STEM, the way how STEM works is by resting a tiny electron probe, which is often half unstrung in diameter, on a specimen. We integrate electrons after they interact with the specimen utilizing annular shaped detectors. And then you can get the atomic resolution images, uh, such as uh, and what is shown on the right side. And you can also put your electron beam at the any atomic column you are interested in and the finding, uh, find out the chemical species as well as the bonding information. Very recently, monochromated use allows us to also probe op optical and the vibration responses in materials. So my first example I would like to talk about today is uh, looking at uh, the stability of uh, LiPon lithium metal interface using in-situ STEM. While a stable interface in a battery requires an energy over, uh, overlap between the, the conduct, uh, conduction band maximum of solid electrolyte with the lithium redox potential, the reality is that uh, there is often a gap. For example, here is 0.69 volts for LiPon and the lithium redox potential. And I would strongly recommend you to read this theoretical paper on the right side. Actually, it summarizes all those the electrochemical and the chemical stability con concerns in the solid electrolytes. So this means that lipon reacts with the lithium metal when they are ad adjacent to each other in a battery cell. On the other hand, the electrochemical measurements often show that LiPon has an exceptional long cycle life. For example, by pairing with lithium and the spinel, it shows 90% capacity retention after 10,000 time cycles. So such a contradiction drove our TEM study. Here we used the STM tips 
based uh, biasing holder. This holder allow us to put the specimen and the aleatine metal coated tungsten tip in microscope and then make contact. And then afterwards, we can also apply a bias in situ in the microscope column. So on the right side is an in situ video. video. I, I would uh, hear the lipon is uh, on the top right and uh, the bottom left is the lithium metal. And I would like you to pay attention to the surface of lipon while I'm playing this video. So as you can see here, an um, apparent reaction occurred and then stopped when an interface layer of around 90, uh, 60 nanometer is established. And this interface layer kept stable over time and upon a bias of 5 volts. So what is exactly happening in the, uh, on the surface of Lipon? So detailed EOS analysis found out a decomposition reaction occurred with the reaction products of these uh, three binary compounds, lithium phosphide, lithium oxide, and the lithium nitride. Among these three compounds, lithium phosphide has a concerning electronic conductivity, which means that it might be not stable with lithium metal and may further react with lithium metal. Um, but however, this can't explain the excellent interfacial cyclability of lipon. And then we further did the elemental mapping. It actually reveals the secret. As you can see here on the right side, phosphor signal is actually absent at the outermost surface of lipon, which means that lithium phosphide is well separated from lithium metal by a layer of lithium oxide, explaining why the interfacial reaction does not propagate. We believe such a phase distribution at the interface leads to the stability of the lipon lithium interface. And this results also tell us that an appropriate thickness of solid electrolyte layer should be considered in the design of all solid state batteries. My second example is on reviewing dendrite growth mechanism in solid electrolytes. Dendrite growth is a bothersome phenomenon in many current solid electrolytes. In polycrystalline ceramics, such as LLZO lithium, lanthanum zirconium oxide, it often um, was reported that it, it grows preferentially along grain boundaries. Many previous studies revealed that surface defects and the porosity play an important role initiating the dendrite growth in, uh, in in a cell with the LLZO. There are also theoretical work showing surface porosity and the grain boundary may also serve as dendrite formation sites. I won't, to, won't talk, discuss about their work here because of the time limitation. What we have done is to characterize the, the grain boundary combining various microscopy techniques, including cryo-EM, monochromated use in situ TEM, and fib sectioning. This work uses a hot-pressed LLZO pellets synthesized by Jeff, Professor Jeff Sacramento's group at the University of Michigan. The pellets are highly dense and such that porosity is not a concern here. EBSD analysis show that uh, the grains are completely randomly oriented. High resolution images show that the, the, the grain boundaries are all composed of high indexing surfaces, indicating the atomic scale structure of grain boundary should be deviated from that of the bulk. Chemical analysis, including both EDX and the EOS, only detect uh, only detected a slight drop in oxygen content, while the concentration of all cations, including the dopant element, alumina, are the same in the grain boundary as that in the uh, grain bulk. Low loss EOS uh, reveals the obvious difference at uh, the, some grain boundaries compared to that of bulk. And here is an EOS line scan across a grain boundary of LLZO. The spectrum from green boundary region are highlighted in red. 
and it can, the difference between the green boundary and the green signal can be more clearly seen in an overlaid uh, spectrum plot on the right, right top right. As you can see here, a, a band gap of 5.7 eV can be clearly resolved in the green spectrum, while that of the green boundary is much smaller. Measuring the band gap of each spectrum in the line scan set, data set show a distinct gap reduction at green boundary. Such a band gap reduction is not the uniform along, among all the green boundaries. In fact, many of the green boundaries, at least half of them, showing a, a same green boundary green, green ba, uh, band gap as that in the grains, which is around 5.8, 5.7 eV. And the different local green boundary atomic risk, uh, um, uh, while the other ones actually varies significantly. So different local green boundary atomic configurations or chemical deviations is likely responsible for band gap variations. We also performed the in-situ biasing TEM to prove the lithium metal preferentially in, in, uh, growing along green boundaries compared to the bulk. EOS confirmed that it is the metallic lithium instead of lithium ions which in, uh, infiltrate along the green boundaries. In order to look at the distribution of lithium dendrites in a shorted pallet, we performed the fifth step step tuning perpendicular to the, the pallet plane. So please look at one of the circled areas while I'm playing this video of the fifth section. As you can see here, there is a dark spot appeared at some point and uh, disappear later, meaning not all dendrites are connected together uh, with each other and uh, isolated dendrites do present within a, a solid electrolyte. So the combination of all these uh, evidence which tells us that narrowed local band gaps at the grain boundaries may lead to scattered nucleation within solid electrolytes, in addition to the dendrite growth from interfaces, a mechanism that is well known. Scattered lithium nucleation at the grain boundaries may also connect and form grain boundary dendrite network, leading to short circuit. So this is just an additional mechanism to the well-known and the more probably also more frequently occurred mechanism um, and we, we already know in the solid state batteries. And with this, I would like to conclude my, uh, my presentation. So I have talked about two examples uh, using in situ stem uh, and uh, and also monochromated the EOS as well as uh, as actually cryo EM was used for high resolution imaging in this work and um, uh, all these different TEM techniques to look at uh, interfaces and the green boundaries in solid electrolyte and there are I believe there are actually there are more. Uh, techniques, especially emerging STEM techniques, are being used in solid electrolytes. I wish you to, to report to you next time. And with this, I would like to thank all my collaborators. All work I talked about today are, is not possible without the contribution of each single person I listed here, including both my, uh, including microscopy theory and the synthesis groups. And especially, I would like to thank the support from the material synthesis and the electrochemical analysis groups, Professor Jeff Sakamoto's group at University of Michigan and Nancy Dutton's group at Oak Ridge. And I also would like to thank the BES for the funding support. And at the last, I would like to thank you for your attention. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions and the comments on my presentation. Thank you.